Hi, um, I'm Naomi um, and I'm a lecturer in youth and community work here at Goldsmiths. Um, I have a background in youth work. I was a youth work practitioner for several years before I did my PhD looking at young people's engagement with organised religion and then went on to work in academia um, where I've taught um, students who are training in youth and community work as well as doing research around young people, youth work, religion, inclusion and youth crime. So today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about some research I did as part of um, a home office project that was looking at the context around young people and young people's engagement with organised crime um, and what type of interventions and tools work um, in the prevention of their engagement with organised crime. I'm going to talk about some of the themes that came out of research that we did with young people and practitioners about young people's engagement with organised crime. We spoke to practitioners who were working with the young people from a range of sectors including youth work, social work, education, police, probation, youth offending. Um, and we talked to young people who were considered maybe in the at-risk category um, of engagement with organised crime. We spoke to young people who had engaged in crime. Um, and we spoke to um, young people who might be in the target kind of um, cohort for preventative resources around um, engagement with organised crime. Um, and the themes that came out of those um, consultations that we did with all the practitioners and the young people um, were quite important when you want to think about developing interventions that will work um, with young people. Um, and firstly, um, one of the most important things that we found was that both practitioners and young people felt that the line between the perpetrator, the young person as a perpetrator of crime, and as exploited by wider organisational networks, organised criminal networks, was really quite a blurred line. And that that's often missed um, in some of the work that we do um, to prevent crime. We found that there was, it was really important that there's a trusted professional as a role model in prevention work. It's not just about having great tools, activities and programmes that the professional who the young person can trust and work with over a long period of time is quite key. Um, that young people need us to know which consequences actually have an impact in prevention work. So sometimes we focus on educating them about the wrong consequences and the ones that don't have as much as, uh, of an impact. And that's based on some flawed assumptions that we have about why young people engage with crime. And that young people often felt, or, or and practitioners also, that stigma and stereotyping needs to be avoided when we're working with young people around organised crime. And that could be stereotypes or assumptions about race, about age, about gender, but also about why and how young people get engaged in organised crime. So to prevent young people's engagement with organised crime, we need to ask young people about what works. We need to ask them about what's true, about our assumptions, about why they engage. There, there are a lot of assumptions out there. And what I'm going to do for the next few minutes is talk about three key myths that came out of the research as, as things that need to be busted about young people's engagement with crime and how those myths might lead to some misplaced interventions. So the first myth um, that I'm going to challenge today is that young people have a big choice or dilemma moment when they first become engaged with crime. Um, so we often kind of frame interventions or education about making the right choice and not the wrong choice in those big dilemma moments. But actually, the research that I did suggests that young people don't necessarily have that big moment of choice or that big dilemma of, 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 of it's now or, or never that I get involved in this. And that actually, the way that they get involved in crime is much more subtle and particularly how they might get involved in organised crime because they can be groomed or exploited over time um, and by the time they're involved, by the time they realise what they're involved in, it's often too late for a big moment of choice or dilemma because they're already to an extent trapped in the situation. Um, and some examples of that um, from the research include um, young people talking about the kind of areas they live in and who you can and can't challenge and who, who you might engage with. And one 13 year old talked about an older young male in her area who it was quite hard to kind of challenge, who everybody looked up to, some people were a little bit afraid of. Um, and she was walking down the street one day and 
he knew of her, she knew of him, they would nod at each other and he said to her, walk with me like you're my sister for a minute. So she walked, walked along with him down the road um, and then she became aware of the police at the end of the road and realised um, after she'd walked down the road with him that she was acting as a form of protection, that he looked less suspicious if he had a younger female walking down the road with him. And it's very hard once you've been involved a little bit to say no the next time when you're asked to do something else. Young people talked about being bought takeaways or given old mobile phones over a period of time before they were then asked to engage in a favour back for their new friend or, or, or person who'd been befriending them over a period of time. It could become more sinister than that. Um, one um, police officer working in the northwest of England told us about a situation where a local woman on a particular estate had, didn't have much money, she was a single mum, she was looking after her family and a local man who was quite not notorious in the area came into her house and noticed that she didn't have a sofa. He helped her out, he bought her a sofa and a few months later he said to her I need your 15 year old to do a bit of work for me. Very, very hard in a situation like that to then say no. Um, and one young person explained it to us really well about once you've become involved, that trying to get out once it's too late, once you owe favours, by saying it's a no-win scenario, either the police or the gang are going to get you. Um, and we also found um, from talking with practitioners that young people with learning difficulties had been found to be particularly vulnerable um, and that work needs to be done not around these big moments of choice or dilemma that don't exist but about understanding who is a friend. So instead of focusing on young people making the wrong choice, educating them on the subtleties of how they might be groomed or exploited into something and to understand who is a friend and who isn't. Um, and often there, there are scenarios where someone who has been a friend, it can turn quite nasty if they want to leave. And, and the practitioners who were working with young people with learning difficulties gave us one example of a young person who was quite badly beaten up when he tried to get out of the situation that he was in. Um, another police officer told us about um, organised criminal groups deliberately getting the people working for them into debt so organising raids when they knew they had either drugs or money um, so that then they owe money to the, to the next person up the line and it's then very hard for them to disengage.